Welcome, 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 welcome. We back for another session of Vet Talk. How y'all doing today, Mr. George, Uncle Patrick? What's going on? I'm having a great day. It's just been wonderful. It's a little bit of rain, but a lot of sunshine, and it's been a really good day. I know that's right. time with some friends, and I'm I'm good. (laughs) How about yourself, Uncle Pat? I am having a great day. Very grateful. I really am having a great day. I love being with you guys. I appreciate this. Same here, same here. I'm having a great day. And like Mr. George, man, uh, we had a slight delay today because of the rain, man. It started raining down here. And I don't know what it is about Texas, the, the power lines and the electricity during the time when it storms. But every time it storms, it seems like all the lights start flickering and things start going out. I don't know what's going on. They need to fix that grid or whatever's going on around here. It's called Texas. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, man, I can say I'm having a great day because I know coming up for us on, on the 4th of July, we're supposed to be in Cancun, Mexico. So I look forward to it, man. My first time in Exi Medico. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so today, man, we, um, what we want to do, man, we're going to talk about relationships in the military. Because um, I think that's a big topic, a big subject. I mean, there's so much that we can talk about. Um, and we're just going to start talking about it, man, because I think a lot of people need to hear a lot about um, how the military affects relationships or we want to really reach out to those people who may be having issues because of their time in the military and they may be struggling with, you know, their relationship with their wife, with their children, um, just various relationships that affect um um affect you you know each and every day so i mean after the military so um we're gonna start out with you uncle pat man um what kind of impact did the military have on your relationship well, oh, me, it because a lot of things i did not understand when you i got out the service in 1979 mm-hmm. so a lot of things i just simply i was not told i didn't understand uh I remember when they closed Vietnam and everyone came home and this, it was a major impact. When you're young, it's a major impact, but it affected my relationships because I I stayed hidden. I may have had a career, but I stayed hidden from everything else in my life. I know how to, in the military, they taught us uh, structure. They taught us skill set. They taught you nothing about living, life skills. When you have a relationship, when you're in the military, and you're not there. No one tells us about that or how to deal with the challenges it's going to be being a veteran. And even if you are of two veterans together, that don't mean that you're always gonna be stationed together. So it has a great impact, but it did check, it made, well, three divorces, I guess, (laughs) with three divorces, (laughs) maybe four, (laughs) I know three. (laughs) But I'm learning from that. The military in, in, in itself, the whole process is, is separates you from everybody else. It, the, the first thing the military does is it strips your identity. That's what, that's what boot camp does. And yeah. when you leave boot camp, you're not the same person that, sh- that got off that bus. Yeah. And the people you left at home don't really recognize you when you get back. You look like sort of the same person, but you're not. Yeah. And that's the whole start of some of the dysfunction that you have because you're separated from everybody. And when you get to your unit, then they create a, a brand new family for you, which is the unit. Yeah. And, the, and the unit mission and goals become your mission and goals. And anything else has to be second. Yeah. Where in the real world, in the civilian world, your family would come first. That's Some people, right. they let their jobs come first. But most people, their family comes first, their job comes second. And if, with that, if you do it that way, then you, there's a difference in how you everybody relates together. No. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree with um everything y'all are saying because um I can think back to my time um 
I guess when I first got to Fort Jackson, I was single. I was a single individual. I didn't have I didn't have a wife, a child, any of that going on. So being a single soldier, man, life was pretty fun and easy. But it wasn't until um after I left Afghanistan, my wife at the time was just a friend, got pregnant, and <laughs> that's that's where they start changing everything. Like that sour taste started. I started having that sour taste in my mouth, man, for the all um, military, not because of the military, but because of the stress. And relationships, it's like they go hand in hand. Relationships and and um being in the military, it's, it's a stressful situation, man. Especially um because like for me, most of my time, I spent in isolation by myself. Um because of you know me being stationed in one place. My wife, of course, we didn't join the military together. We met each other while being in the military, so that put a big strain on us because, I mean, we had to do our time separate and trying to have a family and being separate. Oh man. It's, it's one of them things that I don't wish on nobody because it was very stressful, very stressful. Yeah, and luckily the Navy did not do that. You could, you could be stationed on the same in the same geographical area as your spouse. You couldn't be in the same command, but you could be in the same base in different commands. See, for the army, it was all about um, you know, it was the same thing probably with the Navy, Air Force. It was more, uh, it was all about slots. Like you know, they have to have slots for you to go certain places. But for me, at the time, the thing that um made it difficult was when I got reclassed to MP. We weren't married yet. We didn't get married until after I was already in Cuba. But by that time, she already had orders to go to Germany. So we were already starting out on the, you know, on two different paths. And then I was promised once I got to um, Wiesbaden when she was at it in Germany, we were going to be together. But at some point um, when I got there, they decided, hey, you're not an E6, you're E5. We don't have an E5 slot for you in Wiesbaden, so you're going to have to go to Mannheim and work at the um, main prison versus um, working at like a holding cell um, facility um, for where E6 was slotted to be at. So. That's what changed for me. Yeah. You do run into those issues. You can go up, but they won't let you go down. Yeah. And I know one of the biggest things, you know, Uncle was asking this question. He was, you know, he always wanted to know what was going on. Like, how did, you know, how did me and his niece, all that stuff came about? Well, for us, here it is. We two young soldiers on deployment. And anybody who know anything about deployment, man. You're in isolation, so you find yourself getting closer to the people in a way to where, like what you were saying earlier, like when you go through that separation of being away from your family, go through training, you start going through these different um, situations with these people in your unit, it's like you form a bond. So for me, during the time when I would go through my worst moment in Afghanistan, my wife now, Latanya, his niece, um, we, you know, that's how we started talking. Like we used to just talk all the time. She's a little bit older than me. I'm a young buck, so she really wasn't trying to talk to me too much. She like, young boy, get out of here. But I kept, you know, being persistent, trying to talk to her, trying to talk to her, trying to talk to her. And one thing led to another. And the next thing I, I look, we were closer to coming back from Afghanistan. And at this time, which we weren't supposed to be doing this because the general order number one was you weren't supposed to be, you know, having sex or doing anything while on deployment. Well, anybody know anybody, <laughs> in the military, if they say don't do it, we're going to do it. So one thing led to another. She ended up getting pregnant while we was on deployment, but nobody really knew she was pregnant until after we got back. Because I think we was like, I would say like a few weeks to a month out before coming home. So everything wasn't noticeable until when we got back and people looked at her stomach and now there's bulge. And they're like, when did you get pregnant <laughs> on deployment? <laughs> And that's how it started out, man. I mean, it started out like that, but, you know, with it being like that, it's a lot of different things that come with that because anybody who knows anything about the military, it's hard on women. I mean, I, I have to say it's hard because when you're in a unit, the most women you may have in a unit for the Army, I would say at the most probably be like 10 to 15 women. And you talking about a unit with over probably like 150 males. So that's like a war zone within itself. And people competing, fighting, competition, testosterone, like all these different things going on and where 
You know, everybody mm-hmm. competing and fighting for a woman. So our relationship, when it first started out, it, it didn't start out good, you know, because again, we were in the military. For me, part of my background, I went through a lot growing up. So by the time she came along, I already had trust issues. Then, you know, seeing a lot of different things go on in um, Korea, where I was first stationed at, you see women who, you know, they look like good, wholesome women, but then <laughs> you find out that there's so many different <laughs> things going on. When I started, you know, fooling with her, it was just like, I don't trust military females. Just so you understand, like, we could be cool, but I don't trust this. And da, da, da. So, you know, that made things even more harder and more difficult. And once she had my son, it kind of changed my perspective on a lot of different stuff. And I know most people were like, you shouldn't marry a person for a child. But for me, I had already been through a divorce and I couldn't just leave that situation without, you know, being, I guess, you know, fulfilling my obligation, which was my child. And then she already had had two kids. And, you know, I learned that, man, if you like her enough to fool with her, <laughs> you better love her enough to be with her. And yeah. I'm not going to say that was the, it was an easy, it was easy decision to make, but the trials and the things that came with that, it was rather difficult. And, I, and I'll be honest, it wasn't something that I can, you know, get through on my own. It took the Lord to really, really help me deal with a lot of things that I had been through because, man, I don't even know how we made it at, you know, in the beginning to where we now 12 years in the game. And that's that's rather like uh, uh, an amazing feat because most people who married do military, went through all the things that we went through, they don't stay together that long, especially around the time when I was in. Like you seeing people left and right. You see people be married for a year, Next year they're divorced. Next year they're married with some, to somebody else. Like so, you just see so many different things from people constantly, you know, breaking up, getting married, contract marriage. Like it was a lot of different things going on in the military around the town when we got married. So every day when we wake up and see each other now, it's just like Lord, we know it was you because there's nowhere in the world we made it through everything that we've been through and we still married to this day. And part of me coming back to Texas was because of some of that. After getting the work that I needed for myself, I knew I needed to work on my marriage. I knew I needed to work on my relationship with my wife, with my father. Just it was so many relationships in my life because of my hurt growing up that I had, you know, it was so many bridges I burned. And, and you know, the military on top of the stuff I went through as a child, it just, man, I was a walking, ticking time bomb, man. So I needed a lot of work, a lot of work. And the one thing I tell anybody, man, don't give up on the situation if you can fight for it. Because, I mean, for me, I look back at it now, my marriage is worth fighting for. And the reason why it was worth fighting for, because, again, I couldn't put my son in a situation where he didn't have me full time. And that's something that I knew in my heart I didn't want to do. I didn't want to be a part-time dad. And I didn't want to be a secondary, you know, in a secondary situation. I'm not knocking people who've been in, in those situations. But growing up, I already had been through divorces. Because, you know, when your parents divorce. You're a part of that. Rather, you know what I'm saying, you, you want, you like it or not, or people think that way or not, the child is, you know, they're in that. You know what I'm saying? Because now they got to deal with being separated and, you know, sharing, you know, sharing like different moments with different parents at different times. It's just a lot of different things that, you know, you go through. And then when you go in the military, then you constantly start becoming accustomed to, you know, picking up and going. You start developing them same habits of routine into your marriage. And then next thing you find yourself not wanting to be married because why you're so used to, you know, picking up, leaving, going. You're so used to change and things just constantly changing in your life. And so it, it makes it hard to even stay married, man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In the Navy, we did a lot of short term. I mean, every month we were going somewhere. And sometimes we were we would be on three different deployments and we, we didn't have that many people. I mean, we would send two people in three airplanes someplace and have another one, some have another couple of somewhere else all that's, doing different things. That's way different than what I went through. And so it, it, it was stressful. A lot of, a lot of families didn't make it. And a lot of people that it was, it's hard on people yeah. because I mean, you you have no continuity. Uh, things happen faster than you than you're prepared for, yeah. and 
you just you just can't can't keep it all together. Yeah. George, I have a question as well. I love what Vincent just said about uh, Vincent's younger, and uh, I love that uh, he mentioned about his marriage, both in the military. How was it for you, George? And, and if you may ask us, how long you been married, or just things? How has it been in your life? Being from the Navy, how's it been in your life being married? It's it, it, not hard. Most of the units I was in, family wasn't treated as as something else. You know, the families, we, we tried to keep all the families together, tried to keep everybody kind of communicating with each other. And a lot of us lived close to each other. So if we were on detachment and you had a problem, then whoever was not gone would help your family. And, it, and so it took a lot of the stress off of going because you knew that there was somebody, if you if, if your family had a problem, there was somebody that was gonna help them. And it, it took a lot of stress off of them because then they didn't have to worry, you know, what am I gonna do if he's gone and something breaks or whatever like that. I mean, and a lot of times, I. I would help. I, I would see somebody. I'd know somebody in a, in a different unit. I know they were gone and their family's having problems. They're, you know, I'd fix their vehicle, whatever I needed to do to help them to get keep going while the, until their husband or wife got back. And it was just, you know, it wasn't, wasn't even a question of whether we were going to do it. It's just, you know, what do you need? And let's get it done. Well, George, not that we want to know your personal business, but let's look at marriage, the time of marriage. How long, if we may ask you, how long have you been married? Okay. I met my wife when I was 13. Oh, wow. We got married right after I went after I got out of A school. And we've been married, all, it'd be 50 years this December. Wow, you know what? That's goals, man. Congratulations on 50, and I look forward to that, man. <laughs> well, Vincent, also, uh, I like the fact that I'm one, but George has got George's birthday today. I'm not going to say who's the oldest. Uh, I oh, happy birthday, birthday, Mr. George. Happy birthday, man. Yeah, birthday coming up. Okay, coming well, up. happy birthday to be, man. Thank you. Yes, uh, but Vincent, I like that hearing your story about you and your wife both being in the military and how that affected you, but yet still, you're still together. Like George has said, he's been married for 50 some years. I've been divorced three different times and I just now developed a relationship with my children's mother. She's in Japan right now. We were laughing before we got on here because like she said to me, uh, well, in my career, like in the military, once you figure out a certain type of structure. You're so used to that. And then for me, I never wanted to share about what happened or why or when. You were not going to understand to me. And I didn't know how to convey that anyway, how to tell you something about me. But to you guys, you're still working at it where you look, you're talking to a guy that's been divorced, but now developing a relationship with his children's mother that's in another country right now working. This is amazing because it's about the tools. A lot of us, would, some of us, for me, and it's not all people, we don't grow up with these tools, these coping skills, the, the, the different things between men and women. Not that because we see you, we like you, you like us. It's a lot more after the first two experiences that we may have with someone. Yeah. Living is totally different. The issues of living, being a parent sometimes, are totally different. So uh, I'll go. I'll go with you, Vincent. How has it been with you, with with that? What tools are you using? Um, again, what I'll say is, man, the ministry that I'm a part of. That's I would say that's the biggest piece to why we still together. Because um, again, after um getting out the military, those same issues we had within the military, they they came along with us. And I and I say the bulk of it wasn't just the military. The bulk of it was. My issues before the military, the military was more like the place of, I guess, cover up and get away from everything I've been through. And at some point, once I got married and I got out the army 
it all came crashing down on me. Like I told y'all about, you know, um, on the previous um, interview of how I had that breaking period and all that stuff came crashing down. And um, when I first got out of the military, me and my wife, we were split for like a whole year to where technically we were living around the corner from each other. But a lot of it had to do with the fact that, man, it's just a lot was going through my mind. I mean, I'm just getting out the military. Some of the things I was dealing with, with um, the medication, it just so much things were going on in my life to where like everything in my life, that first year after I got out the military, the first two years, everything went crashing out. I went from being the E5, making good money to almost homeless, like almost in the streets, almost um, to the point to where me and my family almost lost. We, we technically lost everything, but Lord put certain things in our life to where we didn't lose quite everything, but we lost enough to say that the things I got out of the military with weren't the things that I traveled to South Carolina with because um, at some point, you know, when we were going through all that stuff, I ended up leaving her and my kids and just everything. Like I just shut everybody out and I ended up back home in South Carolina. And at the time I started going back to church and um, it just felt like, like something was going on within me and I couldn't explain it. I didn't know what it was, but I knew I needed help. And once I started getting some of the help that I needed, it's like my mind was clear enough to think like, you know what, what am I doing? Like, why would I leave my wife? This is a good woman. I got a real good woman. And I felt like I just didn't give her the chance that, you know what I'm saying? I needed, I needed to give her because again, I ain't never give myself a chance because for me, I guess at some point in my life, when all that stuff happened when I was younger, it just, I, I don't know, it just was on this destructive path, man, where I didn't trust nobody. I didn't feel like I can be with somebody. And if I did, I had a lot of insecurities with them, with myself, just a lot going on. But it took the Lord putting the right stuff in my life, which at the time was my pastor on these DVDs. And he was teaching me things that I didn't know growing up about um, being a provider, protect the priest, you know, giving me that giving me what I needed to hear. Like at the time, I, I never heard nobody tell me that God made me be a provider, protect the priest. So mm -hmm. my whole life, is, it felt like I was just always searching for something. I was always searching for relationships to, I guess, help me deal with my issues. I was always like just searching, just on this path of searching. And it wasn't until I heard that I was a provider, protect the priest, did it start clicking and everything in my life start coming to some kind of, um, happy medium or to like to a good place um to where now man i'm happy to be a husband i love being a father and everything in our lives are just i mean it's, it's good like i can't complain about anything man i mean i've opened up my life to her i told her about everything um i got healing i got i have a better relationship with my dad with my mom i mean like my life now compared to what it was when i first got the military it seemed like it's a 360 man i mean even from folks I've heard along the way, man, I, I try to go back and apologize, make peace with everybody that would allow me to. Some people didn't accept it, and I'm good with that. You know what I'm saying? I understand that when you know we hurt people, I mean, they have that right. I wish and I pray and I hope that they would forgive me, but at the same time, I'm not living my life in that what was. I'm living in what is, and what is is, I mean, I'm blessed. I'm good. So just I'm constantly fighting and moving forward, man. I'm not looking back. Like that. Now, uh, with you, George, you have a lot of training. And I love the fact that your time you spend in service, uh, things that you've done, but you have a lot of training as a mentor. When you have younger people that you're maybe now mentoring, what advice would you give them? One of the things that I've seen, I've noticed that in even with no matter where people are, is you have to be whole within yourself before you can do anything else. If you have issues, you have, you have serious wounds that you haven't grieved, you haven't, that you've been just, you just put a bandaid on it and went on. At some point, you're just going to bump into something, and pull the bandaid off. And then it's all going to come gushing out. And it's going to come gushing out usually on somebody or around somebody who doesn't know the backstory and they're going to, and they, and they don't know what to do yeah. and they don't know how to accept it. And that's where, you, that's where you really get into, into trouble because they have no idea, you know, 
most people don't understand that if you talk to somebody and you just talk to them, mm -hmm. you will find out what's going on. But you can't walk up to somebody and demand that they tell you what's wrong. Mm -hmm. It That doesn't work because the walls go up. But when you just talk to somebody and let it let let them get comfortable and let the information start to flow, then they'll they may not ever tell you exactly what's going on, but they're always they're going to tell you enough that that if you really watch and paying attention to them, you can figure it out and you can figure out how to help them. Okay. That's pretty good. Now, Vincent, one thing I love what you're saying as well, when we first met Vincent, um, you were still in uh, North Carolina, I believe. South Carolina. Uh, South, Carolina, South Carolina. And you were talking about, when we first started talking, I just got here to Houston and I listened to you a lot. I was going through my own struggles coming here to work on myself. I'll be honest with you. I only came here, uh, I heard something they called the recovery. And I'm thinking, what do you reply? What, how do you apply recovery in your life? And at my age, but I remember listening to you. And when you shared being a veteran, being not only with my niece, but being with your wife and how you were uh, developing those coping skills on how to do that, you helped me to develop a relationship with my children's mother. I would never thought that, but because I listened to you, that helped me a lot. Listen to George helped me out a lot because before this meeting, she's in another country and for the first time, we're laughing and talking because we never did. We happened to meet, uh, she came to be a lawyer. At that time, all I wanted to do was go to Vietnam, be a medic. And at that time, they needed medics, you know, mm -hmm. Vietnam clothes, they needed the medics. And me wanting to go to college to become a nurse, back in my day, you couldn't tell other people being a male, you want to be a nurse. <laughs> but I thought my call it was go to Vietnam and save everyone. But because of my uh, relationship with the two of you, I'm learning from you because I know when she told me, uh, it was quite a, about a few months ago, she mentioned to me, well, you never told me you, told me you was a veteran. All those years, now that you had your stroke, someone else told me that you are a veteran. I was thinking to myself, well, why would I have told you? Because you would, have, you would not have understood, not knowing if I would have told her something and been uh, will, willing to let go of a lot of things, then my life would have got better. If it wasn't for me, but knowing that I have a higher power above me and coming here to Houston from Florida, leaving everything to come here to work on myself, I would not be sitting here right now because I came here to work on me. And I would suggest to anyone, whether whatever age group that you may be at, Find their tools, their coping skills, their boundaries. There are a lot of solutions. Houston, coming to Houston gave me a big toolkit to have relationships because I thought I was the only one. Why would I share something when I'm the only one having these feelings and talking to two of you? Two different prospects in life. But I listen to your feelings, but they're very similar. And that makes you feel like, especially when you know, being a veteran, my best times was. Really, to be honest with you, I love basic training. It didn't really bother me. I, 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 it was, I had a good time in basic training, but I love being on base with these guys. Not until I started telling people I'm a veteran when I came here to Houston. No one ever knew I was a veteran because I never told anyone. But by me being connected with you guys, like others would be with other veterans, it's a different connection, guys. It is a bond. Yeah. Yeah. Almost all military people have that they, they have that bond. If you if you don't have if you can talk about nothing else, you can talk about the night you got off the bus. <laughs> that, that starts a conversation that can go on for a long time. Oh yeah. And and from there you can then you can spread out and 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 deal with all any issue that comes up. Yeah. Because there are because it, the military is just, it's full of issues, but it's not yeah. full of solutions. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's what most people like myself, I went in the military thinking that the military would help me with my issues. But what I didn't realize was I was going to a melting pot with people full of issues. We all had issues because most of us, like when I went, I was 21. And, you th and I think about all the people I was around, most of us was 21 through probably like 30, 40 at the most. 
But you think about that, like we kids, like at the time where we should be in like a, a healthy relationship, we were on our own trying to figure our life by ourselves without no guidance, no direction. Because most people think and assume that um, when you go in the military, um, they give you structure. They do to a certain degree, but you have to be willing to fit within the structure that they give you. And if you're not, then you don't survive long in the military because the, the average person don't make it out of basic in AIT, not because of physical fitness and different things like that. Sometimes it's just mentally, some people can't handle being in the military, somebody yelling at them, telling them what to do. And that was one of the things I know for myself, like, yeah, I love people yelling at me, drilling me, but because I grew up in a household of Marine, to a certain degree, I didn't like people cussing at me. So anytime I would have folks in the military start cursing at me and saying things to me a certain way, I'm flipping out, I'm trying to fight my superiors, and they're looking at me like, Cinder, you a good kid, what is wrong with you? But at that time, I didn't know that that hurt that I had from home, I didn't know I was still caring. I thought when I left home, I left my issues and I left my problems. Not realizing like, bro, no, it's, it's still in you. It's just, it's a matter of who gonna shake you up enough for it to start coming up to the top. Right. And that's what I started uh, finding military. That's what I've always seen. It your problems, you put them in a bag, and when you leave, you just pick them up and take them with you. Now, when you get to your new place, you don't always open the bag up right away. Yeah. But jostling it around, the zipper just slowly comes open, and then one day you find out that your problems have sprung up, and they're, and they're just slapping you on the side of the head, and the rest of the world has no idea what's what was in that bag and why are you, why is it bothering you now. Oh, yeah. I just told you to go, you know, to go do a field day in your workspace. And all of a sudden <laughs> you, you're yelling and screaming and just losing it. And I'm supposed to be sympathetic to that. Yeah. yeah right. <laughs> you know, we all deal with something differently. Um, I know for me, being in the military, I, I enjoy, I enjoy it because being in the Air Force, I'll be honest with you. I just work five days a week, guys. I was off two days a week. Now, I don't care what shift I worked, uh, being in the Air Force, uh, I enjoyed the experience. Now, other things, a lot of things in the service I did not like at all, the issues that we had, like you said, you got a lot of broken people. As I'm only just turning 18, I go into service, Vietnam just closing. So all these people coming back with all those issues. So the war never ended in Vietnam. They just brought it back on the base. Yeah. And I didn't. I never saw that happening. When you just turn to eighteen, and you thinking, man, I'm going to save the world. You know, I'm gonna serve my country, be a medic. I'm gonna be in Vietnam. None of that happened, God, because they also said, this is what we need from you right now. We're looking at your test scores. We're gonna put you in the technical department part of this here because we want you to do certain things with missiles. That's not what I wanted to do at all. So I was already lost, and then dealing with every all the brokenness that I saw, because I thought everyone drinking coffee was always just coffee. <laughs> I had no clue oh, yeah. how oh, people no. felt. And then I had a good friend, <clears throat> my was in Alaska, good friend. I think he was like, uh, he was like master sergeant. Now he's been kicked out the service. He didn't been through Vietnam. He didn't been through, a, but alcoholism. Yeah. And yeah. I remember him coming to my uh, house on the base and his wife had just left, but he could not stop drinking. And all the time I was in the service, not only did I see the battling of people, the issues, but I never thought, I thought it was always coffee that everyone was drinking. Now I saw the changing in people during the daytime yeah. because they, I'm thinking, well, man, I, let, me drink, let me drink some coffee. I put a lot of sugar in my coffee, but I never had the feelings like they had. <laughs> and, and just, when you just turn 18, you don't have a clue. And then I, had, I, didn't, I didn't go in the military with any structure, with any tools. So when you go in the military, then all of a sudden you dealing with something similar, it's a big difference for a lot of us. And right now, a lot of veterans do not know. You're thinking that like what you mentioned also, Vincent, how, how it was structured, certain type of structure you grew up with, your dad being a Marine, your, your parents maybe separating or whatever things you went through in life, things you going into the military with, we're not the only ones that were going through that. Yeah. We just thought that, for me, I thought if once I joined the military, I was going to be a medic, I'm going to save the world. I really think I'm saving myself. 
but not knowing that I was going to be so such a broken person. Yeah. I never knew that because I waited till I'm sick. I'll be 67 uh, next month, but it took me to be 60 to come to Houston and say, wait, wait a minute. I've heard people talk about these recovery tools. I had to come here and work on men, marriage wow. classes. Not that I'm looking to get married, but I wanted to know how that work because I've been gone from my family for 37 years from Houston. I got to come back and have a relationship with them. I didn't have relationships with my kids or with my relationships, being divorced so many times. I had to work on me. First thing I wanted to do, marriage class, before you get married, after you get married, how to stay married, how to apply that to family. Yeah. People that you now going through training with again, or you volunteering with, you still gotta do, you gotta have the structure. You gotta have the toolkit available because one of the things I love about what you mentioned, Benson, since I've been knowing you, you talk about that. Yeah. A lot of people don't do it, but you talk about that. There's no point in being ashamed of it. I mean, that's who I was. And one thing I've learned, I, and it's crazy, I learned this from an athlete. I heard him say something in the arm in the, in the sense of he was like, um, I think he had committed domestic violence or something like that. And um, somebody asked him, how um, how is it that he's able to move on? And he was like, he realized that whatever he'd done, that's who he was. And there was nothing he can do to change what he had done. Only thing he can do was change how he um, go about his business moving forward. And that's how I live my life every day. I just choose to, you know what? Everything I've done in my past, that was me. Because the first part of um, healing is acceptance. Like, you just have to accept stuff. Like, you know, I had to get away from blaming my childhood. I had to get away from blaming my, um, blaming the military. Like, I had to stop pushing the blame off on everybody. Because the one thing about um, people who get, who, who, who are hurt, they live with a victim's mindset to where they feel like they're the only victim or they're the one that's been victimized. And with them living like that, they can't see how many other people are, how they have hurt other people. And for a long time, I couldn't see that. Like, I couldn't see because I, you know, like I remember um, like a couple of months ago, the Lord took me back and reminded me of when I first got my heart, my heart broken by this girl. Because the whole time I thought it was like, you know, the stuff I went through with my parents. But he took me back to a childhood relationship I had in middle school. And when the thought came back to me about that relationship, I'm crying as if it had happened that that day that I was crying, I was crying about it because I had totally blacked it out, forgot about it. But when I went back to it, I was like, so that's what my hurt with and trust and lack of trust started with, with females. I thought it was stuff because I kept because I kept trying to figure out in myself, why do I always have this feeling like my wife is doing stuff, but my wife ain't doing nothing? Like I'm dealing with some, and I didn't realize it was that one incident that had happened like some years ago that got buried by all the things I was doing along the way, that, that was the true issue. And when I was able to deal with that, then now I can walk in my house. I don't feel like my wife doing nothing. Da, 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 da. Like, you know what I'm saying? Because I actually dealt with what was really going on. And I mean, that's what I believe a lot of people have to do. They have to really just stop playing the victim role and really just take responsibility and say, hey, it's me. Like, you know what I'm saying? I got some issues. I got some things I need to work on. Just be real with yourself. Because, I mean, you can't be real with other people if you're not going to be real with yourself and just really deal with the things that you've been through. And that's what happened for me. I, I finally started dealing with this. I finally start saying, you know what, let me stop pointing the fingers and take the responsibility. Because, again, I look back at the trail of women that I've been involved with up until the time I was I got married and sometimes doing marriage. Like, that was a trail of people. And, I, and now I'm thinking, like, damn, that was somebody mom. That was somebody wife. Why would I, in turn, you know what I'm saying, take advantage of an opportunity just to appease myself? That's selfish. You know what I'm saying? Knowing about, you know, just knowing life from a different perspective now, like, dang. And I had to take responsibility for all that. And that was part of me letting other people off the hook because I started realizing, like, I need to be let off the hook. I need the Lord to forgive me because I've done a lot. And when I look at my track record and my life and who I was, man, I really needed forgiveness. I really needed forgiveness. So... That's what helped me to forgive people. It's just really realizing the fact that I was filthy. I, I had a lot of issues and I needed forgiveness. I love that. Um, one of the things I learned too was when I taught taking so many classes, uh, anger management, I thought it was only about the anger part. So when the person was talking about they have a class for anger management, 
uh, I'm thinking I'm not mad. Uh, my issues from the military or in my life, uh, I, didn't, I didn't understand why I would want to share them. But when he got to the part about forgiveness of yourself and others, I went there for like eight months. I ended up volunteering in anger management, <laughs> but uh, it gave me the structure. I, you know, I am ex-military. I, 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 I like structure. When I went to anger management and about forgiving myself, I said, whoa, wait a minute. I thought I was a victim. My maybe not so much in my childhood that I look at, but the military. When you're so young and there's a lot of violence, a lot of things going. It's kind of like you in a war zone on a base. I never saw that happening. But when I looked at the face, think about wait a minute, I'm not a victim. They're giving me tools now. I got to forgive myself. And what role did I play in a lot of things in my life? I may have not known, but yet I still play, like you mentioned, Vincent, in your life. I played a role in some of this stuff in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to ask you again, George, I love the fact that you've been married for such a, a long time, uh, a great time, uh, being veteran. Where are you in your life, in your marriage? Because I know that you volunteer a lot. You with the motorcycle club, you all do a lot. How is that in your life, in your marriage? Sometimes it's straining, sometimes it's not. Some, you know, we've been through all of that. We've, we've had different work schedules. She's worked nights, I've worked days. I've had extra, job, you know, extra jobs after work, you know, and it, it sometimes puts a strain on everything. Mm -hmm. But you just, you know, to me, I, I just kind of go through it. If she, if, she, if she gets upset, you listen. You, you know, you don't, it, you, you can't make excuses if, you know, you, you just have to own what, what's yours. If you can't own what's yours, then you, you really can't have a, an adult relationship because you, you're always trying to push it off to the side. You're always trying to deflect the direct criticism that needs to come your way. And you can't, yeah. It, yeah, and if you're doing that, then you're, you're also deflecting change. You can't change if you don't, if you want to accept the criticism. I, I like that because I came to Houston because I heard someone and I was going through my moment. I was in mental health. You know, I got the, I got the car, I got the townhouse being built. I got a great mentor in my life, but yet I try to commit suicide. I'm going through my own issues. So I end up in mental health. I'm listening to this other veteran uh, in mental health. He's talking about certain things, but I heard he, he went through this here. It was a, a quote and it was about change. And when I heard that, I said, whoa, change. I didn't think about that. You know, about the change part. You think about, for me, I thought about so much in my life, but I didn't think about change at all. I do another, another career maybe, or do something different, but I didn't think about change. But also what I learned from my mentor is about acceptance. You know, it's it's hard to, uh, to think about that or how you may want to define it. But I was in a meeting once and this these these are older guys. Uh, that's in recovery, they call recovery. And they're from all parts of the country. And I think one guy's in Canada and the guy that was in another, I think it was another different state, but now he's retired. You know, he's retired, he had a good career and now they're living in a city that he's not from or nor is his wife, but his wife, she, she loves a church. She loves things she's volunteering in, in his mind, he was going to retire and go to Florida by himself, you know, get a house, uh, get himself a, 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 a boat. And he's going fishing. He said, I, I deserve it. I worked it my whole life. I deserve this. We are going to Florida. And she said, no, I don't want to go. <laughs> he said, he's going, what? And we've been married for how many years now? They've gone, they've gone through so much in life. But he said, no, I deserve this. She said, I I love my church. I love what I'm doing in volunteering. And then he told me one day, he said, he told us rather, he went outside, he got in the chair where he was standing. He didn't want to be there, but he sat down. He said, he learned a lot about recovery, about acceptance. He said, he just had to accept the fact that this is where she wanted to stay, whether, she, whether he wanted to or not, but he loved his wife enough. He said to us, he's going to stay. 
And that's about that acceptance. Another gentleman that we're talking about in our 60 age groups here, tell my guys have been in Vietnam and in, from different branches, because even the Navy was in Vietnam also. They're out oh, there yeah. on the coast, but they're also oh, there. They were, in, they were on land. Yeah, okay. And I, I, I like when they yeah, shared I mean, that because when the guys, that's what I want to come back with you. I want to hear that part that, you, that you're going to talk about with that is when you're talking about that acceptance part, that's a major issue in our lives. Uh, when, when the guy was telling me, well, I think I'm trying to remember where I was thinking that he said something, but I know he's going to stay there where he was about the part about acceptance. But there was another part there that I learned so much from people that are a little bit older than me, but had more structure that I ever that I learned. Like I said, it took me 60 to start working on myself. Did already started at one point. So I like that. And I will ask you again, George, you mentioned about the fact that you are Navy, that, that you are on land. How is some of that things that you've heard or certain experiences about what, what you know about? Well, my experiences, my, my whole journey started early. You know, I, for a lot of people, they, their, their journey starts, sometimes their 30s, 40s. I started to recognize who I was and, and what my abilities were in my teens. I mean, I can remember in middle school being able to, to evaluate a person and, and spot their fears and never having talked to them just by their interaction with other people. And, and could and would be right. And that was something that kind of I've always been able to do. So and I've always been people always been able to talk to me. So with that, it helps me to to navigate the world in a different way, because self evaluation was something that I've always been able to do. You know, whether I changed or not, I knew what my issues were. Good. Now, let me ask you a question also, George. Uh, Vincent being being here, being military, uh, wife uh, also military as well. What do you do as a mentor, George, uh, talking to people like Vincent or listening to people as a mentor? Because when you go to that mentorship training, that's, that's like being in basic training or being in the military, uh, you know, with someone a little bit higher ranking. But you have, they have good structure. How, how would you look at that? How would you approach that? Knowing the people, that's like, I, from Vincent, I didn't know about what Vincent told me about being overseas. I, I was in Fairbanks, Alaska, like forever. But I'd never been overseas. I'd never been to Vietnam. I used to, I used to happen to go in when that door just closed, when everybody's coming home from Vietnam. But how, what do you talk, what do you do when you listen to people? that Because you've met to a lot of people. You work with a lot of other veterans. How do you do? How do you work with that? With different branches from different places, with different issues. You, like I said, first thing I do is is I love I listen to them. You got to understand what their issues are, because you, you can't depend on somebody to tell you what what their issues are. You have to get it through a conversation, and the conversation a lot of times does not revolve around their issue. The conversation revolves around their side things, that things that they like, things that have given them trouble, watching them work on things. You know, I love to watch people fix things because that tells, I can tell you a person with anger issues within five minutes. And I can tell whether it's new anger issues or it's deep seated anger issues because of the way they way they look at things, the way they handle things, because it, it all comes out differently. But you don't see it unless you have, unless you have a full interaction with the person. You know, that's why when you, when you had a psychiatrist that you could talk to for 45 minutes and you could talk to them a half hour at a time to, to work through things and then they would evaluate what was going on the, the last part of the session, it, you got a lot more out of it than you did going in there and you talk to somebody for five minutes and then they spend 10 minutes making notes. Well, they haven't learned anything about you in five minutes. 
and it, it'll, it'll take 20 sessions before they get enough info about you to make a rational, really good decision and, and judgment on you, what's going on with you. But if I talk to a person an hour here, a couple of hours here, because when you really sit down and talk to somebody, time is irrelevant and, and it just flows. Once they start to flow, you just let them flow. And then you will see that everything comes up and all of those things that are so buried, because I tell everybody, you have to grieve. Whatever wrong that's been done to you, you have to grieve it. Until you grieve it, you're still carrying it. You know, okay. until you grieve it and put it in the grave, then you can walk off and leave it. But as long as you're burying it, it's weight that you're carrying. I, have to, I want to ask you a question, George, not to cut you off, but did you get some of these tools also from some of the training that you've been receiving for the last few years? I know we met in training uh, in Austin one time. Have some of you guys some of these tools from your, first of all, definitely from your marriage, you know, having that. There's uh, also my some tool, of the training you can provide there for you as well. My tool came from leadership training and, but not the tools, the stuff that I got from the, the, all of the training that I've gotten in the last couple of years, it's, it's, it just gives me credentials to use what I already knew. Because I had been doing this for a long time. I've been, I was doing this before, but because I didn't have the credentials, it doesn't count except in the military, but I did it in the military, a lot in the military. And I was, I was an instructor. So I got to train you know, E threes, E fours, E fives. That was part of the that was part of the groups that I trained in that. Lead, give them leadership, give them advice, and show them. I mean, I left a unit that had six C had yeah had six E fives, a six E sixes in it. All except one made E seven and eight within three years of meeting me because I showed them how the structure was, how the, how things work and how think, how to think like you're going to succeed because nobody had ever shown them how to think successfully. They showed them how to, you know, I'll show you how to be a follower, but nobody ever shown them how to be a leader. Nobody had ever given them tools to lead with. That's what I, that, that's one of the things I love to do is give people tools to lead with and see how far they can, and, and they can take them and run with them. I like that. Uh, but go, yeah, keep yeah. going, George. Yeah, but I, but really, I'm, you, you have to make sure that people grieve the issues. You can never get past an issue until you grieve it. You may not wreck, you may, you can, and you can bury it for a long time, but it's always going to come back because it comes back in actions, if nothing else. I like that. Uh, Vincent, you also mentioned what George is talking about right now, the things that you have been learning because you would be a great mentor because you've been there. You've been in a place that like I have not been overseas. I was just in Alaska like forever, but you've been overseas. So we talked one time about what I thought poorness was, but you, when you described what you saw overseas, but I'm thinking that I can be poor in certain aspects of my life, you're saying, no, I did not see what you have seen or had the same ex uh, similar experiences that you've had in your relationship with your wife or prior to that. So I love what you what you're sharing about. But what would you at this point where you are, Vincent? What would you uh, say to not to give a suggestion, but to say to another veteran that's going through relationship issues? What would you uh, say to that person? Um, I mean, I piggyback off a lot of what um, Mr. George was talking about because those were things I had to do. Um, first of all, acceptance. Like you got to accept the fact that you have issues. Like you have to first come to that place of understanding and knowing you have issues because most people don't even realize that what they've been through made them a, it made them a problem or made them um into a monster or whatever whatever it made them into they became something else because of whatever they went through so you got to first first realize that it changed you it made you someone else to the point that you're not really being yourself you being yourself 
through the lens of what has happened to you. Like you've seen everything through the hurt, through the pain, which don't allow you to always see things the way that they truly are. Like, say for instance, you have somebody who's um, like say for instance, you have a strong leader, and this leader sees potential in you, and they talk to you in a way to where they're not being you no know, derogatory or anything like that, but they talk with such passion and things to where they're really trying to get the best out of you, you end up turning that situation into a, you end up seeing that situation as somebody yelling at you. And really, they might not have been yelling at you. They really, really seen something in you. And they're just trying to tell you, hey, I need you to really do this and they own you about it. And if you are hurt and you're dealing with hurt from a father or somebody else, you would take that, that encouragement and you would turn it into, oh man, they don't like me and they're this and they're that. And I mean, you just gotta, you just gotta first of all come to an understanding of um who you are and what life has made you and two, so that you can finally just start dealing with it. And then two, like he said, you gotta grieve. Like um when I finally got over the issues with my dad, how I ended up doing that part. And like I tell people, yeah, I've I, I forgiven him, but I had to learn healing as a process too. Like, yeah, like we are good, like there, there's no issues, but I'm still healing because for I carried that stuff for 30 years. And when you think about a wound, a wound that been open that long, it just don't heal overnight. So you have to realize that too. Like, yeah, I forgive, but it's still a process that I'm going to go through every day because any little one thing can trigger you and it can make you start feeling like you feel like you felt the day that you forgive. And you, and you know what I'm saying? So part of it, like I have, I realized that I did forgive. So when those things come back, I just say, nah, I already forgave for that. Let me keep moving. Let me not let this little thing caused me to relapse and go back into that. And that's because I had my grieving um, moment. But again, the, re- the way I had that grieving moment, um, my pastor one day, we was he was talking to us as men and he was explaining to us some things that, you know, he had been through as a child or whatever the case may be. And he's, you know, told us how he finally got his relationship um, with his pop right on um, five years previous to him dying. But um. One of the things he didn't do was he didn't really, really, I guess, grieve or deal with it in that way. So he still was carrying some things. And one day his wife said to him, well, baby, you know, you can't talk to him, but why don't you just write a letter as if you're talking to him? And when he started writing that letter, um, I guess to basically express to his dad what he had wanted to say all them years, he found himself crying and letting it go. And when he said that, I was like, huh? And I heard it, it just like rung a bell in my ears. So I was like, you know what? Tomorrow morning when I get up and I do my reading and my praying, I'm going to do that because, you know, once I learned about, um, about you know, forgiveness, sometimes you can't go approach people with what they've done because, I mean, I mean, if you're bringing them like 200 pages worth of what they <laughs> they're not they don't <laughs> So I knew I couldn't go to my dad with that. I was like, I'm going to have to get healed from this stuff without going to him like that because I don't want to cause him to back away and not talk to me. So how do I do this? And that solution that he gave, she um, she gave him, that he gave us, I did that. And when I started writing this stuff, I mean, I was boo-hooing like a big teddy bear. I mean, just crying, 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 crying. And then I just felt in my heart, you know what? Tell your dad how you felt. Don't blame him for what he done. Don't point the finger at him and say it was your fault. No, just mm-hmm. tell him how you felt. And I told I said, Dad, you know, growing up, I hated myself. I hated myself because of everything that was going on. And when I said that, and I didn't approach him in a way to where I was accusing him, he opened up in return and started apologizing. I wasn't going to him for apology. I was just telling him how I felt. And through me telling him that, he started apologizing to me. And again, he didn't owe me that because, I mean, he just didn't in my book, but he did it. And that started repairing our relationship to the point to where we were able to move on. So, I mean, again, for somebody, they would just have to get to that point where they come to themselves and they grieve and let it go so they can finally move on. That's very true. I like what you both are sharing because for a lot of us, like, again, I'm 65. I'm just now learning, guys. I'll be honest with you, it took me a lot to come to Houston and to uh, looking for these, these, this structure, for these coping skills. Because they gave me a big kit, uh, a tool kit to work with, with these different tools. A lot of us need to need these tools because even at the age of 65, being very grateful that I'm developing a friendship with my children's mother, 
uh, I could not have done that without going out there and working on myself. Knowing that about the marriage classes, that the, the language, I know that there was a marriage language. Knowing that also from a biblical standpoint, knowing what it meant to be yoked with a person, not because you were attracted to that person for any physical reason, uh, but being yoked. What, what do you want to, how do you invest into a relationship? I knew nothing about investing into relationships. I just thought it was always about my career. Like if some of us was in the military, only were you on base that you really feel like, man, I got to deal with all the issues on base, but I'm here to do my job. Well, it's the same thing in a marriage. When you come home off that base, wherever you're coming from, you are now at work again. Use those tools. Those are totally different tools. Coping skills, the art of sometimes just listening. I learned that in the peer support training. And one of the things I loved about that, one of the, I had uh, one of my teachers, because of my stroke and getting ready to have open heart surgery this week coming, uh, I have these teachers now because I got a good tool kick because I was so, felt so alone here in Houston. Although I got the training to be a mentor, I didn't get the training for living skills for myself. Going to financial management, learning how to pay my bills correctly. Uh, I, it's a work, everything is a work in progress for me, but I, I like the fact that by working on me, I'm learning a lot more, like what we're talking to now. That was, I know when someone came here the other day, one of my, my speech therapists, I have a speech therapist, because of my stroke, a lot of my words come out. So I have someone to help me to read because I can't hardly really see on the right side. So she was mentioning some things and she was talking about her and her husband. And she was talking about, she was trying to explain something to her husband. I remember going to a class and it was a class about this lady and her husband talking. They come in the house, they sit down and this husband, she wants to talk. She just wants to talk about her day. He looks at her and he sees this big nail in her head, her forehead. It's a big, uh, it's a big nail just sticking out of her forehead. So he's looking at this nail, he's going, whoa. Uh, he's trying to, he's shaking his head, looking at her. She's talking about her day. He's looking at this nail in her head. So as he's, as she's constantly talking to him, he keeps going out, uh, you have a hole in your, in your head. Are, are, are you hurting? You want to go to the doctor? He says, what are you talking about? Can you just listen to me? His whole time was looking at that nail in her head. And that's, a, that's something what we do sometimes. We either want to save to be the savior. We're going to fix it. And sometimes all a person will wants to do is just supposed to listen. And I did not learn that until meeting you, Benson, being on my knees about the structures you've been learning. Listening to George, George has been with me for two years. Uh, George knows about my stroke, the heart attacks, the cancer, the stroke. Uh, my, my things that I make it difficult, like George taught me how to operate my, my laptop. And I, not my laptop, my phone. I did stage lighting for a living. I had to read the strip. I had to go to rehearsal. When I came here to Houston, I had no skill sets for relationships, how, how to write, to read. I heard what people kept telling me what I could not do. Like when I walked into McDonald's, they said, well, I couldn't place an order. If it wasn't for you guys giving me though, put in my toolkit about my relationships, the listening skills, going to classes, I would suggest to anyone, whether you're a veteran or non-veteran, work on it. There's a class for it. Yeah. And sometimes we don't want to accept the class. What people are asking me sometimes, why are you in marriage class? Are you trying to get married? No, I want to know how to deal with my family, how to deal with other people. I'm trying to learn life skills. And the one thing the military gave me good structure in, and that was survival skills, but they gave me nothing in living skills. Yeah. Didn't teach me about the math, how to pay my bills. Didn't teach me how to deal with my relationships. Didn't teach me, say, well, okay, after the military, even if you go 30 years in the military, what do you do then? Gave me no, no skill sets in that at all. So, you know, and not until we get, even when we come out the military at some point, or if you're still in the military, there's a lot of tools here, especially with the VA. People put the VA down a lot, but I'm going to tell you something. The VA provide great programs. And when those programs may not work for you, talk to other people that's been there. They're going to give you other places you can go to. It could be, it could be your church. 
It could be volunteering someplace. It don't always have to be, well, I went to church, it didn't work for me. I went to the VA, it didn't work for me. Find someplace that does. Because just don't give up. Because it wasn't for you guys. I mean, especially with George marriage of, 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 of what, 40, 50 years? 49 years going on 50. 49 years. I've been married three times, George. So I, I, can't, oh. I can't even do that, do your type of math. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even out the math at all. But Vincent, my, that's my niece. You know, and I've not known her that well because I was always gone. She just knew she had an uncle at some point, maybe during the Air Force, but I was, I've was i been gone out of Houston for 37 years. My family doesn't even know me. In fact, I love the fact that I just had to learn recently, I didn't even know myself. You just knew what I did for a living. You had no clue as to who I am. And not until we come on board to meetings like this do we learn from each other. Because George, I mean, I will, uh, at, at 65, no, I will not be married 49 and 50 years, George. I don't, I, 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 the math just does not add in. <laughs> Six, oh, 100, what, 105? That math does not, not work at all for me. So that's not going to happen. But uh, Vincent, man, your, your struggles, your structure, uh, the things that you learned in the military to do with you, what they taught you in basic training, man, you, are, you have a fabulous life. You're, uh, you're a great dad. You're a great husband. You're great in the community, what you're doing. To start this up, this meeting here, man, this is awesome. So I'm going to let you guys close this out because uh, I would like for you guys to keep continuing this. I would love for us to keep doing this. Before I go have surgery, I think it's on Wednesday, I have surgery. But guys, keep doing this because George, man, you got so much to give to so many people. Vincent. You open up these doors. I mean, I didn't know about this. I mean, I tell you, you just open up so much in my life. When I would listen to your military, your life experience, not just military, but your life experience. I would love for you guys to keep this going. So at this point, I just want to say uh, uh, thank you guys for what you're talking about. And I want you guys to close out. Uh, if we want, let's let George go and, and Vincent. Can you please close us out at the George talk? I will, I will, I will. <laughs> All right. Well, I enjoyed tonight. I relationships and and we're helping people work through some of their issues is what I enjoy doing. It's what it comes naturally to me. And it's just it makes my day when I can help somebody. It I can't always help myself but I can always help somebody else. So that's one of the things that I, that I come to realize, but it's, it's something that I can live with because the, the ability to help others and I let God work on me. Mm -hmm. And then whenever it, he makes a suggestion, I follow it yeah. because I'm not supposed to be in Houston. That was never one of, that was never part of my plan. I was never supposed to be this far south ever. <laughs> so, you know, it's just the way it's just the way it worked. Yeah, so. and, and I didn't mean to piggyback off that, man, and to close out. It's the same way with me, Mr. George. Um, I would say 2019, I think, is when I came back here, July, somewhere around that time frame. Um, I actually was back home where I'm from in South Carolina. I was back home. Um, things in my life was it, it was getting better, but it's still I still had some struggles, some issues. Um, because as a young man, not you know having my father at the time of my life because of you know how I felt about certain things. Um, I didn't have that male, I guess that 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 the male that that male presence in my life that I needed. And I needed to be around strong men. So what happened is the pastor that I had been listening to those DVDs and hearing all this stuff that he was um, talking about and teaching me about, you know, being a man and, you know, about being a provider, protective priest and taking care of my family. Um, it's just like one day I was just sitting there um, listening to the stuff um, that he was talking about. And it's almost like the Lord was speaking through him. And he kept saying that it was no reason why I, sh I, I didn't have my family in church like i needed to have my family in church i need to have them around like-minded believers and structure and things that would you know help with just everything that was going on in our lives at the time 
And when I heard that call, that's what drove me back to Texas. I didn't know how I was going to get back to Texas because at the time, I, I don't, I wouldn't even hundred percent yet, but it just like, um, I would just, I just knew I needed help. So I told myself, Hey baby, you know, I, well, I didn't tell myself, I told my wife, I was like, Hey, in a year, we going to end up leaving this place. Well, fast forward, things went bad. I got my hundred percent. And soon as I got my money, I was like, baby, you know what? Things are so jacked up right now. I knew she wanted to leave and it was just a lot going on. So I was like, you know, I, I, was, for, I was in the race for time. So I just had to make a decision. And that decision was, you know what? I got to take my family to where we can get help at. And that's what being in the ministry that I'm in, that was, that's what it was about. It was, it was about the fact that I need to help. Because again, um, I had to, first of all, um, use that keyword called acceptance. Like I had to accept the fact that I was jacked up and that I couldn't fix me. Like my, most of my life, I thought I could fix me. And the way I was doing that was through everything I was trying to do through, you know, joining the military, through sports, through one time chasing all the women, through drugs, alcohol, like all these things were things that I was doing to try to fix myself. Now I realized all I was doing was damaging myself, but in the process, damaging other people and other relationships that I had. And eventually at some point, if I kept burning all the bridges that I was burning, <laughs> at some point I was going to be living in the flood, man. And I didn't want to do that. So that's what brought me back here. And I would say that was the greatest decision I ever made, man. And now I'm a homeowner, which is something that I didn't see, man. I thought I was going to be living in that trailer <laughs> with that Honda Accord in the country somewhere because that's all I saw growing up. Like I remember sitting in the ditch thinking about that. I'm a country boy. So I didn't see myself where I'm at now, but I, I'm a, I will say I'm blessed and fortunate to be where I'm at. And I thank God for this platform and for this opportunity to even share my story, but to also learn from y'all because again, I mean, y'all the ones who paved the way, just like how my pastor paved the way. And, you know, men in the Bible, like my father, you know, just different people paved the way, even from my father. Regardless of what happened, I, I learned a lot from my father. Now I'm able to see him as the man that he always been. And I realized, man, I, I, I had the greatest hero ever, you know, created because, man, my dad was a man, man. And, and the things he done for me that, you know, I can look back and see now, now that my eyes are clear enough to see and not be looking through the lens of the hurt that I carried, man, I, I got an amazing father, man. And I can't wait to one day even, you know, on this platform, allow people to hear him because all um, me and him talked about it and um, we're going to do something together. But that's what all this stuff brought about, a relationship with my dad that I never had, man. My that, that, that's very good. That's very good. Because, I mean, in, 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 in some uh, upcoming issues, we could talk about, we can talk about more in relationship. We can talk about the difference between men and women, the difference, you know, what happens to a child when when a parent leaves, what happens to a child when a parent dies. I mean, those are those things all affect how a person develops and how they interact with everybody else. Mm -hmm. And somebody has to pick up the slack. And it, if it's good, it's great. If it's not good, it's equally bad. Well, I just want to tell everybody who look at this to like, share, subscribe, and thank y'all for even listening to us as vets, man. Vet Talk is out, and y'all have a blessed day. Thank All you. right. Love you guys. Take care. Have a good one.